afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Columbus Metropolitan Club. I'm Deb Hackathorn. I'm a principal with Civic Point Government Relations, and I'm also proud to serve as the new chair of the CMC Board of Trustees. I am so pleased you're with us today for the forum, which is part of our Developing a Dynamic Downtown series. Thank you to our series presenter, the Columbus Downtown Development Corporation and Capital South. Our series sponsor, Thompson Hine, and today's sponsor, Realm. All of these organizations are helping bring you today's forum as part of our Developing a Di Dynamic Downtown series. We're also grateful to the Center for Human Kindness at the Columbus Foundation and the Columbus Dispatch for presenting our live stream, which is being carried on our social media platforms. And thank you to our new home, of course, the Alice, for their generous support. Let's thank everybody for supporting today's forum. If it's been more than a year since you last visited Franklinton, you might be surprised. Some formerly vacant lots have been replaced by new apartment buildings that look like they've been plucked from a hip neighborhood in Copenhagen. I did not write this copy. <laughs> These new developments are more than just places to live. They're destinations with brew pubs, co-working spaces, coffee shops, and art. No developer in Columbus has been closer to the epicenter of Franklinton's reinvention than Brett Kaufman. Today, we're excited to host an in-depth conversation about his work, his vision for Columbus, and the city's unrealized potential as a modern, sustainable, and equitable city. It is my great pleasure today to introduce our speakers, Brett Kaufman, the founder of Kaufman Development, and our host, returning once again to CMC, Bonnie Mybers, commercial real estate reporter for Columbus Business First. You can read more about our, our guest today by scanning the QR code at your table. Bonnie, we look forward to today's conversation. Take it away. Thanks, Deb. Like Deb said, my name's Bonnie Mybers, and I cover commercial real estate. My work takes me uh, all over Columbus, including neighborhoods like Franklinton. So I'm really excited for today's forum. And if it's OK with you, Brad, I just want to jump in, because I yep. have a ton of questions That's for you. That's great. Yeah, happy to be here. Cool. Well, first one should be pretty easy, talking about your brainchild, Gravity. Can you talk about what the name Gravity means and why you think Gravity is different from other developments in Columbus? Yeah, the uh, history on the name of Gravity really goes back to kind of a very early conversation I had with a good friend, many of you know, Christopher Celeste, who was working on a, uh, a concept uh, that he was calling Gravity. And it was really a white paper on what it meant to belong to something, to be a part of something. And we were building communities where we were trying to really focus on the same thing. And um, Christopher gifted me the name of Gravity. He's been a good partner and investor, and, and we've collaborated on, on the concept. And um, he used to tell me words really matter. And I never thought that they actually did. Um, you know, I kind of looked at Google and any major company and just thought it was really what you did with it that mattered more than the name itself. But as I've seen Gravity sort of take on a life of its own and evolve into all kinds of things, uh, he was right. You know, I think it, it's, a, it's a name that really stands for something. Uh, and what it stands for is really this idea of bringing people together um, that live and work in our community and in the surrounding community in the, from all over the region, hopefully, to come together, to connect, to collaborate, to learn, to grow, to find something that hopefully makes their lives just a little bit better. Um, we say gravity stands for well-being, creative expression, and impact, and everything that we're doing really revolves around those three things. Um, and you and I, in conversations, you've called gravity kind of its own neighborhood. Could you talk about what goes into creating a neighborhood and give me like three things you think are critical to making something feel like a neighborhood? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I would say it's more of a neighborhood within a neighborhood. You know, Franklinton is really the neighborhood and gravity is really hopefully just a part of Franklinton, but it is a community within a community. And, um, you know, it was, it was the original sparks that I saw in Franklinton that got me 
interested in that neighborhood to begin with. And those sparks were really about um, people that were different, that were creative, that were um, sort of gritty, and, and doing things that I personally really resonated with and wanted to be a part of. So, you know, for me, it really does come back to um, creativity. I think that is, is a really core piece of what makes a great city. Um, I believe we're all born to be creative uh, in our own way. It doesn't mean that you have to be an artist, but what are you creating? What's the experience you're creating? Uh, how do you create your thoughts, your relationships, your companies? And it might be art, it might be music, it might be something innovative. But um, that to me is just kind of at the core of what our community stands for, what Franklinton, uh, what I saw in Franklinton, and um, I think it's a really critical part uh, of, of building community. Um, you know, I've worked with folks in Columbus on why creativity really is economic development. Mm. Um, and I think we're seeing that more and more play out. It's incredibly helpful to attract talent, to retain talent, to get companies to want to relocate or stay in Columbus or incubate here. Their, their workforce wants to be living in places and, and living in cities that have art, that have music, that have uh, a creative class. So that's really the, the key element, I would say, in the community. Obviously, the, the design, the, the architecture, the placemaking, you know, the thoughtfulness that goes into the experience of, of the physical community is really important. And then, you know, I think for us, the, the third piece, if I had to pick three, is really maybe the most important, which is what happens inside the building. It's not just about building buildings. Mm -hmm. Yes, hopefully they're aesthetically pleasing. Yes, they're filled with art and placemaking, but then what do you do inside? What is the actual experience that you're offering the people that are living and working and in the broader community? Can you actually offer them something that is enriching their life in some way? And I think that's a critical part of building community. Um, and can you talk about how you have this vision for gravity in your head? You are trying to incorporate those three things. Like, how do you take that idea and make it into a physical building that has people living in it and uh, has several phases? Yeah. Um, well, it's uh, it, sometimes it feels like it's kind of just like happening, and I don't <laughs> even know how it's happening. You know, I've I've actually recently remembered that that back when Christopher and I were talking about this, uh, the original idea is sort of where we're landing, but we went back and focused one building at a time. And so now it's kind of funny to look out and like, oh yeah, that was actually the original idea. Um, but, you know, it's, uh, the, the, whole, the whole reason I started my company to begin with was I was looking for a culture that felt like the place that I wanted to work. Mm -hmm. It was filled with people that were passionate, people that shared vision and values. Um, I wanted to work at a place where I didn't have to wait for the weekends or vacation or retirement to do the things that I love to do. And, and, and our mission was to build communities where that was also the case, that we could bring things that people didn't typically get where they lived and where they worked, like opportunities to volunteer in the community. Early on, it was community gardens and yoga studios and meditation um, lectures and events, and, and still, you know, a lot of that is a big part of what we're doing mm -hmm. today. But um, it, was, it was always about just bringing, and it wasn't like a narcissistic thing about like, what do I want? But, but I did think that I wasn't alone. If I wanted to have a community where these things existed, if I wanted to have a company where this was the culture, I, I thought other people would too. And so I keep kind of finding these things that are showing up in my personal life that mm -hmm. make me feel good, that I enjoy, that are adding value and trying to bring that into the, into the workplace, into the physical space. 
Um, and a couple weeks ago, you and Land Grant announced the Gravity Experience Park. Could you talk a little bit about that and maybe how that ties in with kind of that theory of bringing experiences and bringing things you'd like to see into the physical world? Yeah, you know, for, for many years I've been running around the country and, you know, traveling the world and seeing different concepts and really getting the importance of placemaking and, you know, the experience that, that we have, you know, day to day in our, in our lives. And, um, you know, to me, art, um, music, um, you know, uh, um, you know, fun really matters. It's really important for us to come together and, and have some fun, you know, good food, have a drink, um, be with other people, have a place to go. And so the park was the vacant parking lot for the Idea Foundry. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I was talking to somebody earlier, there was some complaints that we were taking away parking, but um, we built a 964 stall garage a half a block away. So um, there's plenty of parking. And we didn't feel like we needed another building, that that wasn't really what the highest and best use was for that space, that it was more important to create a place for people to be able to come and do all of those things. And that would actually um, be something that the whole community could use, that all of Franklinton, all of Columbus could use, that it wouldn't just be for people who lived and worked in our community. But we also think by having that there, it will drive value and you know, create um, a, a place, you know, a re another reason for why people would want to live at Gravity. Mm -hmm. um, and going off topic a tad, but we will circle back to Gravity, you have talked publicly about your mental health journey. Um, so I was wondering if you could share with everybody a little bit about your journey and kind of how it relates to Gravity and kind of inspired Gravity. Uh, yeah, I don't know if we have enough time. <laughs> a short version. <laughs> uh, where, to, where to begin? And uh, you really don't want to know. Um, the uh, no, mental health is a is a real important um, passion of mine. It's been a, a big part of my journey. Um, you know, sort of uh, using your life to serve you and ultimately to serve others is really what fuels me. And so, yeah, I mean, I, um, you know, had um, some traumatic childhood events and, um, you know, had to really work through that. And, you know, thankfully, through the help of therapy and, you know, a number of modalities, um, you know, good friends and just a lot of work and experience, you know, I've been able to move through a lot of that. It's still sort of a... Uh, an ongoing thing. I don't know that you're, you know, ever healed, but, um, you know, I continue to do that work. I love that work. I'm really um, inspired by doing it, even though it's it's really hard. And, you know, it's been important for me to talk about it, to, to be, you know, transparent and vulnerable. And, you know, I've just been uh, amazed at how much uh, others are also struggling, others who have had similar um, you know, trauma and, and, and are scared to talk about it. I think, fortunately, the conversation's shifting and people are, are a lot more open than they used to be. But, um, yeah, I mean, I grew up at a time where you didn't talk about that kind of stuff. And it's pretty silly, you know? We're all sort of human beings having this journey in life and sometimes it's really hard. And, and I think it's really great to come together and to share that experience and to support each other. And if me, you know, being an advocate or, or out there in the community talking about these things is helpful to other people, um, you know, and then in turn it's helpful to me and it sort of, you know, kind of, you know, starts to shift the whole conversation. Um, and can you talk about how kind of your journey has tied into the ideas behind gravity? I, I know we touched on this a little bit, but. Yeah, you know, I, I mentioned this a little bit, but, um, you know, all the things that, you know, I've seen in my travels or studied or experienced personally, um, things that have been helpful to me, you know, today we're now um, getting ready to open, not today, but soon, our first greenhouse mm -hmm. product. 
Um, that greenhouse product is focused on a lot of biohacking and nature, and we're building out a transformation program for the community to tackle sort of tiny habit things monthly as a community. These are all things that I've personally found benefit in. So, you know, to have a wearable and to think about how, how much you're sleeping and to have a mindfulness practice or think about hydration and nutrition and relationships and um, gratitude, journaling, you know, these are things that I have found to be really supportive in, in my life. And it's just an example of how, you know, we take these things that we learn, that we experience personally, and then try to incorporate them into the business so that other people uh, can have that same experience. Um, and you mentioned Greenhouse. Could you, I know you said Short North will be or could you just give us an update on your two greenhouse projects? Yeah, so the Short North project, um, which is right behind North Star Cafe, it will open in the spring of uh, 24. And we're just in there getting ready to do demo over uh, for the greenhouse gravity product um, today. The fire department's there now, I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. And your second phase of gravity in Franklinton, it has co-living. Could you talk a little bit about what that is, how it's doing in Columbus? Is it a thing that you think could be popular in other developments in Columbus? Yeah, so it's, um, we're calling it shared living. And um, the easiest way to think about it, it, it's, it takes some education because of the co-living language, and you see this in other communities, but the easiest way to think about it is when I graduated from college, I rented a house in Victorian Village, which you know wasn't what Victorian Village is today, with four other roommates, and we shared a bathroom and a kitchen and a living room and a backyard, and it was sort of crappy, but that's what you did. That's what a lot of people do. So that's sort of what shared living is. It's um, rent by the bedroom, you can come with roommates, you can get matched up, it's sort of like that student housing model, but for young professionals or anyone that's you know, looking to be in a communal environment. Um, we also have uh, one bedrooms and two bedrooms in the same building, but instead of being in that house with some you know, unnamed landlord, you've got a fully amenitized building, so you've got access to the swimming pool and to the cold plunge and sauna and yoga studio, fitness, all the events. And the, the kind of sneaky thing about it is um, it's really cheap. So, um, you know, we're also kind of curious about how this is tackling affordability from a market rate standpoint. Um, nobody knows how much money you're spending. Nobody knows that you're in you know, a bedroom, um, but yeah, for 600 and some dollars a month, you get access to this entire community. So um, it's very affordable and, um, and it's working. You know, we're leasing up and so far so good. Do you think this could be a viable option in other Columbus developments? I think so, you know, I mean, it's sort of um, a bit of a, you know, experiment, you know, it's kind of the, the guinea pig, but um, yeah, hopefully if it works, you know, the, um, the economics on it, you know, for us are good too, you know, so, um, you know, why not uh, have everybody win? And I think if that's the case, then it'll be something we'll, we'll build more of for sure. Um, and can you talk about how the office is leasing up at Gravity? Um, I know you're, you're terming it creative office. Could you talk about maybe like creative ways you're going about getting that leased up? Well, it's uh, slow and taking a lot of creativity, um, to be honest. But, um, you know, we're, we're very optimistic about it. You know, I think we've got a really unique product. I think, you know, for us, the importance of having creative office space, the architecture, the amenities, you know, we have um, built a community. And so if you work in our community, you have access to all of the amenities, full gyms, all the events. So we think we have a product that, that um, is unique and um, we're getting a lot of interest. You know, it's just overall the office market is, is slow. Um, but um, we have Ohio Health that's getting ready to open up. Um, we're getting ready to announce a couple more retailers and um, yeah, we're uh, getting close to signing some leases too. 
Um, and I know we talked about how Franklinton, or gravity is a neighborhood within a neighborhood, and Franklinton is a neighborhood of Columbus. Could you talk about how you see everything you're doing in Franklinton playing with what's going on in downtown Columbus? Yeah, you know, I think if you go to Austin, Nashville, any city that you might want to emulate, um, what's great about it is you've got these different parts of the downtown uh, that, that are all kind of unique in their own way. And so you can go to the short north and, you know, which is, which is sort of more of our entertainment district. You've got a central business district. Franklinton can really be more of a creative arts district. Um, you know, German Village is its own thing. Um, you know, things are popping up in other parts of the city now too. So Old Town East has got its own character. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so as Columbus grows, I think the entire downtown, you know, continues to grow. And, and they're very complementary of each other. Um, you know, even the, the peninsula, uh, is is really its own thing, but it's it's very um, much connected to what we're doing. Um, you know, thanks to Greg and, and company. You know, we're working together. We're trying to all accomplish the same thing, which is build this city. And so um, it's good to have things that are unique but connected. And that's sort of how I see downtown. Um, and since we're talking about downtown, downtowns have been recover recovering, trying to recover from the COVID pandemic, um, including ours. Could you talk about how you see, like, are downtowns dying across America? Are they reinventing themselves? Something else entirely? Um, yeah, I mean, I don't really see it as a dying for sure, and I don't even think it needs to be reinvented. You know, I think there was like a little small window during COVID where, um, you know, people were moving out to the suburbs. There was this idea of, you know, wanting more space or working from home. I frankly think that's been like way overblown. And in fact, I think you're starting to see a lot more people realize that being together, being you know, together in an in a office environment, in an urban environment, you know, are, are still sort of, you know, the best experiences. Um, you know, certainly, you know, if you want to raise a family or if you want to be on acres of land or have a little bit more green space, uh, an urban environment, you know, might not be for you. And at certain stages of life, that's great. But um, with, with the way Columbus is growing, uh, with the way that we're now capturing people from Ohio State staying here, you know, with some of the new tech companies and the Intel and all of that stuff, um, you know, I, I started my business um, early on. I was buying duplexes and converting them in German Village, and it was um, because I was seeing people that were working at Abercrombie at the time move here from San Francisco and say, I don't want to live in the suburbs. I'll work out there, that's fine, but give me something that feels like it's, it's got some character, that's, that it's in this sort of dense urban environment. And that's just continuing to happen. More people are moving here than ever, and they don't want to be in something that doesn't have um, character, and I think, you know, our downtown uh, will continue to thrive for that reason. Um, and can you talk about kind of what your ideal city looks or maybe a vision for Columbus and Franklinton in the next 10, 20 years? Yeah. Um, you know, I think it's, it's, you know, in my ideal vision, it's, it's continued to be filled with um, diversity, with um, a heavy emphasis on culture, um, on the arts, on, um, you know, having music everywhere, um, really giving artists an opportunity to work. Um, you know, a lot of creativity, I'll keep coming back to that. Um, hopefully that means new companies that are, um, you know, incubating here and making a difference. 
Um, I'm less excited about the ones that sort of come here, get a lot of attention, and then like don't actually give back to the city. I think that you know we need to continue to emphasize on the Columbus Way, bringing people together, collaborating. I hope this is a city that is known to be as collaborative as any city in the in the country. I think it's sort of one of the secret sauces we don't talk enough about that there's this Midwestern thing where people are very kind and they're open and they're collaborative. To me, that should be like the thing we lean on the most that we're out there talking about the most because if you actually like live here and experience what that's like, people are willing to meet with you, they're willing to help you, they're willing to support you, they get it and they wanna see you successful. That's not normal in every city. And so, yeah, I hope we never lose that. Um, you know, obviously there's going to be challenges with affordable housing, with traffic, with, you know, ups and downs of, you know, economies, gentrification. I mean, those things exist everywhere and, you know, hopefully we can just um, try to be aware and conscious of what we're doing and, you know, tackle those things as best as possible. Um, and you've talked about creativity a lot. You've talked about living consciously. Could you kind of put a dictionary definition to living consciously for everybody? Yeah, um, dictionary, I don't know, because I sort of <laughs> just make things up most of the time. Um, but it seems to work. Um, I, you know, to me, what it really starts with is a, an awareness. It's really sort of being able to be conscious about what you're doing and how you're doing it and what you're aiming to do and really working towards that. So, you know, when we say conscious community, to us it means we're very thoughtfully, intentionally, consciously making decisions about what's being built and what the experience we're trying to create is. And then there's the, the user experience, which hopefully also is making a difference for them in their own level of consciousness. So, you know, what we try to say is we're, we, we'd like to meet people wherever they are. You know, I once was a banker in a suit and tie and stumbled into a meditation room and it changed my life. And so we want the, the, the suit as much as the artist, um, the young person as much as, you know, the old person and everybody in between to try to find something that shifts them just a, a little bit with the hopes that maybe that starts them down a path where real change happens. Um, I think that's really how, you know, we say we, we wanna, you know, change the world and it's super, you know, big and aspirational, but, you know, my hope is if we have a, thousands of people that are visiting and, you know, with things like the podcast and some of the events and, and virtual, you know, could we become a, a regional uh, hub for this content where people are learning and growing and consequently going home and being better spouses and parents and friends? And, you know, what does that do then to a community? How could that possibly become a model for building community and you know, what if that becomes something that gets adopted and really does make a difference in the world? Um, we're gonna move to questions from our live stream and in-person audiences here in a minute. Um, so if you have a question and you're here with us in person, make your way back to the microphone. And if you are online, feel free to type your questions into the chat. Um, but I did have one more question for you. You talked a little bit about how co-living can kind of uh, be a way to address affordable housing or like the stigma against affordable housing. Do you have other ideas that you'd like to share just about kind of how Columbus could tackle that issue from all sides? You know, I've been pretty candid that um, I'm not an expert in affordable housing. I, I really, it's not what we do. You know, we're trying to tackle it a tiny bit, you know, by working with partners like Homeport and trying to be supportive of planning and things like the shared living. Um, look, it's, it's, a, it's a real concern. It's a concern that every market is, is um, hopefully thinking about, struggling with. Um, I don't know what the answers are yet. 
you know, I think that um, our city is doing a good job of trying. So, you know, there's a lot of workforce housing that's getting incentivized. Um, I think it's, a, again, it's that awareness. There's a conversation, there's a dialogue, there's things that are being experimented with. And, um, you know, hopefully that unlocks some real solutions. But it's a real challenge. It's a, a, a difficult thing to do. You know, it's the reason you don't see more affordable housing um, being built is because rising construction costs, rising interest rates, labor shortage, uh, you know, competitive supply issues. I mean, it's 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 barely like like not even actually working right now to build market rate. Um, you're seeing a tremendous slowdown in construction, period. And so then if you try to make that affordable, it's pretty tough. Um, thanks, Brett. Uh, it's CMC's longstanding tradition to take audience questions. Laney Cuthbert is back. Oh, sorry. Sophia is back there at the microphone. If you have a question and you're here in person, make your way over there. Um, Please, out of respect for others, try and keep your questions brief and to the point so we can get to as many people as possible. And please remember that questions end with a question mark. Sophia, what's our first question? Yes, thank you so much. So our first question from our online viewers is, what's the most inspiring development project you've seen outside of Columbus? And what about outside of the United States? Yeah, so um, I know my architect friends are in the room, so they'll probably, they should, they should probably answer this better, but um, Bjork Ingels has been like a big inspiration for me. I think he's doing like incredibly innovative work. I've seen his projects in Copenhagen, um, and um, you know, I find inspiration really everywhere, and, and my kids make fun of me because we'll be traveling somewhere and I'll take a picture of like a front door you know, and, and they're like, what are you doing, Dad? And then sure enough, like it lands on, you know, the Good Ale project or something. So <clears throat> the hospitality industry, I think um, ga art galleries, you know, I find inspiration uh, kind of all over the world. Um, but uh, I would say, um, you know, there's been some really cool stuff built in New York, the, the Highline project. Um, you know, I love these creative arts districts. I've spent a lot of time in Austin. My son was in school there. A lot of really interesting things happening there. I will tell you that early on, um, prior to starting my company, I went on a tour around the country looking at the top multifamily developers. And I was pretty uninspired. I think there's a lot of bad stuff being built all over the place. And, um, and that was actually, in its own way, inspiring for me because I thought, oh, well, you know, it's not that hard to, to, to do it better. And so, I mean, you know, we've worked a ton with Realm and MBBJ and, um, you know, other architects, and I think we've got, you know, something pretty special here in Columbus, um, a great opportunity to build buildings. You see what Jeff Edwards is doing. I mean, you know, there's some really high-quality stuff that's now getting built here. I'm Judy Box, and I served on the East Franklinton Review Board at the time Gravity 2 was still on paper. And I was very impressed with the cooperation you were doing with Homeport, and particularly the issue of parking. But I asked for a special, and I'll use the word favor in quotes, there was space at the south side of Gravity 2 that was sort of earmarked, as much as you do on paper, for a small restaurant. And I pointed out that it was very close to Homeport, where the residents would not be able to afford most of what's being built by way of restaurants. And I asked, please, could that be made available to something like a subway? That would be an affordable sandwich to people living across the street. And I'm just curious as to whether that ever came to fruition. There was no commitment, but I'm curious. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, and I remember you know, working with you from the start. So um, it's nice to see you. I appreciate the question. We have um, not, uh, we've intentionally not signed um, the subways or the cell phones or many of the users that have come our way um, because we don't want gravity to be filled with um, franchise users. Um, we do have a restaurant tenant that is going in that building 
uh, I think that you're talking about, um, not saying that it's going to be affordable, but what we are really excited about is the experience park that's directly caddy, category, caddy corner from Homeport's building where there will be food trucks and a constant rotation of food offerings that will be very affordable. Um, so hopefully we're tackling it that way. Sure. We have another question from online. The dispatch recently reported some of the uh, updates to the zoning requirements that are going to unfold in the next year. Are Columbus zoning regulations amenable to future development and what changes do you feel should be made? Yeah, I'm, I'm actually, you know, not that in the weeds on some of the zoning changes, so I don't want to um, speak to it. I will say that the city of Columbus has been by far the best zoning district for us to work in. Um, the East Franklinton Review Board is a great example of it. Um, the Downtown Development Commission, great example. Um, the Victorian Village Commission, not a great example. Um, <laughs> but um, I will say that uh, there's a lot of support for getting things done. And if you are willing to do some things creatively, if you're willing to listen, if you're willing to actually uh, take in the feedback from the neighbors and actually try to bring something that is creating value um, and is being thoughtful about placemaking, design, affordability. Um, you know, I think the city of Columbus is doing a lot right. Um, I do think that we have to be a little bit careful about thinking that we're further along or that we're better than we actually are. Um, you know, a lot of great things happening. Uh, we have a long way to go. Uh, you know, Franklinton's not over the hump. You see the issues with, you know, some of the crime that we're now, you know, struggling with. Um, we can't just uh, make it, we can't make it too hard. We need to be, one way to tackle affordability is flood the market with supply. Um, flooding the market with supply, incentivizing all kinds of housing actually is going to help with affordability. If we start taking away incentives, if we start making it too hard, if we start mandating what has to be built, um, if we start getting too particular about parking, it's just going to slow down the development and make uh, the problem much worse. Uh, Doug Buchanan, Columbus Business First. Um, referring to your Short North project, uh, it has been a journey, I think you could say. Uh, I'm wondering if you look back now on everything that it's been through, is there some lessons you take away from that, things you would have done differently? Um, there's, there's not much I would have done differently. I mean, you know, yeah, the lessons are, are they're not really fun ones. You know, honestly, you know, what we originally proposed would have been a much better product. Um, it, I think it was like nine stories, maybe 11 stories. Um, you know, I, I think it's sort of silly. People get kind of dug in. You know, I don't think that a seven-story building is much different than a nine-story building when you're doing that. Like, is it really ruining the neighborhood? Not if the right quality is being built. So. Um, you know, the lessons that we learned there is, um, you know, some of these commissions have, you know, people on them that are just, you know, don't get it, frankly. Um, you know, it, it turned out good for us because in the five years it took us <coughs> to get zoned, the land value tripled and, you know, the market's much better. And so we built something that, you know, is going to be great and work and, you know, we still feel really proud of the end product, but frankly, it could have been better if, you know, there was a little bit more of an openness to, you know, what um, quality product means for a city. Hi, Brett. Kelly Stevelt from the Wexner Center for the Arts. Thank you for your support of the arts in our community. Um, I just wanted to see if there are those who want to infuse art, creativity, well-being into their development. If you have advice on how to make a business case to potential events investors for that. Yeah. Um, 
I'm not sure if I totally understand your question, but you're you're asking um, is there a is there a business case for why it makes sense for art to be infused into the project? Yeah, I think yeah. when you go to Gravity, it just stands out, and um, I think it speaks for itself at this point. But early yeah. on, how you got people to buy into that conceptually? Yeah, I mean, early on, um, I see Sue, and and um, you know, we would sit with bankers, not Sue. <laughs> And try to explain why, like, having a yoga studio wasn't wasted space, you know, why some of the things that were on our pro forma were going to actually drive value, and it was a lot harder to explain that. Um, so we've always had to kind of underwrite to the competition and then just sort of secretly believe that having all this stuff was actually going to make a difference. And if it didn't, then... You know, we were, you know, even with the competition, if it did, we'd be ahead. And now it's a much easier conversation because people get it. And, um, and I think, you know, for us, you know, we stopped trying to explain it to people and just start doing it. You know, things like the experience park don't really make sense to anybody. Um, but it makes a lot of sense to us, and I think when it's built and it's open and it's active and everybody's excited and using it, and that then you know helps us fill up our buildings, you know there's a business case. So <clears throat> hopefully it's more um, about just doing it and proving it out, and then hoping that you know others see that and replicate it. All right, we have another question from Nancy Nanny, and I think that this question will actually be relevant to a lot of the folks in the room today. Are there any plans for performance space for plays, dance, and guest speakers? Yes, yeah, so part of the Experience Park is um, a, a stage that we will um, be doing that to some extent. You know, we have rooftops um, and event spaces in all of our buildings, so, you know, last Friday we hosted um, both, I think, um, the symphony and we had a don't tell comedy on the rooftop. So, you know, those kind of performances are happening. I think there's, you know, discussions about, you know, what else we need um, as a, as a, you know, as the peninsula has, you know, uh, the potential to continue to evolve as a cultural um, neighborhood. Um, you know, what else maybe comes in. You know, again, it's not my business. I don't really know the um, event space like that. Um, but, uh, you know, so I don't know from a business standpoint just how it works and if there really is enough support. I think a lot of these uh, things are privately funded and, you know, maybe that's, you know, the way it needs to be done. But um, I'm certainly an advocate for more, you know, I'd love to see us have more places for people to, um, you know, have performance uh, you know, opportunities around the city. Hi, Brett. My name is Brian Urbanski with the Aubrey Affordable Housing Foundation. And uh, my wife and I have been housing providers for about 20 years in Columbus. And we've been providing shared housing for vulnerable populations as far back as 2014. One of the challenges that we all face in this space today, as you've alluded to, is that everything is expensive. The, the real estate's expensive. The utilities and everything are expensive. The shared housing model that you have at Gravity sounds like exactly the type of steps we need to be taking to keep housing affordable, particularly for the folks who need it. Is your model that you have at Gravity, is that duplicable where other housing providers that would like to provide this in the space um, would be able to look at your model, take that and run with it, particularly to support the lower income residents that are struggling today like they've never struggled before economically? I think so. You know, I think it's a little early to, to say. You know, like I said, we are leasing up. Um, I think it's working. Um, and, you know, hopefully it, it becomes something that uh, others want to replicate. And, you know, the truth is, is it's not that complicated. You know, it's just a matter of willing to take some risk and do something different. Um, like I said, you know, the student housing model uh, has proven out. And so it's sort of similar. You know, you're signing an individual lease for a bedroom. Um, you know, there's a learning curve and we're working on roommate matches and, you know, things like that to make sure that, um, you know, it's a good experience for everybody in a common unit. But um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's not our intention to have the 
um, you know, kind of intellectual property on this concept. Um, you know, I've, I've said openly if, if shared living or conscious communities becomes the norm and everybody's doing it, that's awesome. I'll go do something else. Um, you know, it, we're an open book on this, and if it works and other people want to replicate it, that would be amazing. We have time for two more questions back there. Hi, good afternoon, Brett. My name is John White. I am a development officer with Woda Cooper Companies. We're a, an affordable housing developer uh, based right here in Columbus. And we actually have a, a senior development that's right up the road on, on Broad Street that's currently um, in development. So we're looking forward to, to being your guys' neighbor. Um, back when I was in city planning school at Ohio State in the mid and late 2000s, the uh, Franklinton neighborhood was always such a case study given the decades and decades of disinvestment that that area um, re never received, um, largely because it was always located within the floodplain, so it really prevented um, developers from coming in and investing. Um, along came the city of Columbus. They did the Seoto Mile project on the river. They removed the dam and reduced the floodplain and, and really allowed the development potential to be unlocked. So my, my question for you is, given it's such a, the gravity development is such a novel development, um, not only for Franklinton, but for Columbus, I'm curious to know how did the community initially embrace um, your vision and your concept when you first proposed the idea? I, uh, I think that we were always really welcomed um, I mean, I think if I remember back, you know, Judy and others, Trent, you know, they, they asked good questions. You know, it was clear their hearts were in the right place. Ours were too. You know, we, we tried to um, work together. I mean, I just told Trent, you know, um, you know, they've been doing the hard work long before we were there. Um, you know, unfortunately, Lance Robbins just passed, and, you know, he was a real pioneer in that community. There were so many other people, the Independence Day Festival. There was a lot of people there long before us um, that were really what attracted us to be there at all. And so, you know, yes, we build these buildings. They're big and sexy and new and expensive, um, but... You know, I think we'll have been a giant failure if, you know, we change Franklinton, you know, um, too far from that original spark that got us there in the first place. And, and I hope that the people that were there before us, you know, um, see that what we said we were trying to do, that we've at least tried to do, you know, hopefully we've done it. Um, we'll keep trying to do it. Um, and I think that's really, you know, all we can do. You know, our, our hearts, our intentions, you know, our effort is all in the right place. Um, and, you know, we have our own challenges and obstacles that we have to try to overcome. But, you know, I think we keep working together. And uh, consequently, I, I feel like, you know, there's some good things happening. Brett, I wish we had time for more questions, but I'm getting the wrap it up signal, so I'm gonna hand it back over to Deb. Thank you, and before I wrap up, I think we'd be remiss if we didn't hear a few words from our CEO of the Downtown Development Corporation, Greg Davies. So, Greg, welcome to the podium. Well, thank you. I think I was supposed to introduce Brett, but I'm pretty sure he didn't use any of my talking points. If you can bear with me, I just want to share a couple things, because I spent a lot of time thinking about this, because I love Brett. So, um, you know, when I first heard we're going to build the world's largest conscious community, I thought, what does that mean? I, I don't understand that. It's the same reaction I had when I met Brett. I was down in his office at the Short North. I was working at the city. I walked into his office. He's not there, I get a cup of coffee, I'm sitting there, Bob Dylan's Visions of Johanna's playing, I'm thinking, that's a weird song to be playing in an office, but I love it. And then he walks in in jeans and a t-shirt, and I was like, who is this guy? This is not a, the, the, the normal developer that I meet. 
But that day and others, we talked about the early days of gravity um, in Brett's vision to jumpstart Franklinton into the arts district it was seeking to become. He wanted to build on all the city investment Mayor Coleman had done and Mayor Ginther had followed, and the enthusiasm and the hard work of the numerous community leaders that Brett mentioned that came before him. Um, Brett shared his vision with me, and, and I was very excited, and I went to Mayor Coleman, and I, I said, I think this is a project really worth starting. And, and needless to say, phase one got started, and, and Brett and I didn't see each other for, for, for quite a long time, just didn't cross paths working. And as uh, some of you may know, in, in 2017, I lost my first wife very suddenly, very tragically, and it was, it was obviously very difficult. And not long after that, I got a call <clears throat> from Brett, or text. He said he wanted to get together, and I figured, well, Something's going on with Gravity or his new project, but sure, it was my job. And when I got there, Brett just said, you know, just asked me how I was, told me I had nothing to talk about related to work. And being in a place where I was, I was struggling, I just said everything was on my mind. And that day we had a very, very long, very intense conversation. And over the next uh, year or so, Brett would periodically call me, we'd get coffee, we'd talk about how I was doing, how my kids were, how his kids were, how his family was. and. Uh, you know, it was just odd to me, but again, it was, it was a surreal time, but I was so thankful for that. And he kept telling me that it helped him to talk to me and that, that he was proud of me. And, you know, I just, just kept doing it because it, it felt good. Fast forward to 2019, and I get a text from Brett. I'm at home. And he says, hey, are you dating? And I said, I said, no. I said, I really don't want to. He says, well, that's okay, but when you're ready, let me know, and I'll give you a number of this, this woman, a friend of mine, I think that you'll, you'll like. I said, yeah, great. And then at that point, if you know Brett, I think his ADD kicked in. I get a text, Greg, Liz, Liz, Greg, two of my favorite people in the world. I'll let you take it from here. Now, it's, it's a good thing this introduction is occurring four years after that moment, because I would not be giving this introduction to Brett and how I felt that night. But the long and the short of it, Liz, my wife who's here, uh, we got married, and I'm incredibly blessed, and I'm incredibly happy now. And it took me a long time to get to that place. And Brett was one of the main reasons I had the confidence to move forward. You know, after all those times, him talking to me, it just it settled in. And I'm not even sure we talk business. Periodically, we give updates on our projects because they're neighboring, but we really don't talk a lot about work. And, uh, you know, through the ups and downs, I think we recognize the, the, the significance of shared experiences and ultimately, like gravity, and this is why I'm taking the time to tell you this, I really believe, Brett, when he says, you know, life is really just about love, learning, creating opportunities, and bringing people together. And I think that's the blueprint you heard for, for Gravity. I recently sat with Brett for his podcast, and he said something to me that stuck with me ever since, and it really serves as a guidepost for me. And it puts the past in perspective. And what he told me was, you know, I was saying I was really frustrated and tormented by things that, that happened that I didn't understand at the time that I now understand. And he said, how could you have? You were operating at the level of consciousness you were at then. And it just hit me, and he's right. And I think so when I now hear I'm going to build the world's largest conscious community, I still would be very skeptical, but I'm not about Brett. He's pushing himself and those around him to constantly want more, to believe in the difficult, and to be a fellow traveler as we all go through life. Most importantly, he wants everyone to take the journey to becoming the best version of themselves, and he puts his own resources into making that happen. I consider it a gift, and I appreciate this time that I have the opportunity to publicly share my experiences with Brett. I think he's taught me, others have taught me, we don't always tell people how we feel when we have an opportunity. So I wanted to do that here today. Brett, I'll always be grateful for you introducing me to Liz, for everything you've done for Central Ohio and downtown, and for your continued striving to be the best version of yourself you can be. And most importantly, for being my friend. Okay, there's no way to follow that. <laughs> I'm tearing up. So let's just say I, I learned that Brett has a podcast. So I'm sorry I didn't know that before, but I'm going to now subscribe to it. Thank you so much to our series presenter, the Columbus Downtown Development Corporation and Capital South, to our series sponsor, Thompson Hine, and today's forum sponsor, Realm. We also want to thank our virtual seat patrons and the Center for Human Kindness at the Columbus Foundation and the Columbus Dispatch for presenting today's live stream, and of course to the Ellis for their support 
our very special appreciation to today's speakers, Brett Kaufman and our host, Bonnie Mybers. Thank them here, thank you very much. Please make, please make plans to attend next week's forum, Style Capital, the Global Influence of Columbus Fashion, right here at the Ellis. Take a moment to answer a short survey you find on our website. We couldn't do it without you. Thank you for joining us and have a wonderful afternoon.